immense pleasure to welcome you to the Arijit Mukherjee Memorial Lecture and the 32nd lecture of the Institute Lecture Series on Reimagining India's Health System by Dr. Najib Ekmo. We invite the Director, Professor Uttam Sapha, a Chief Guest, and a Speaker, Dr. Najiket Mohd, Dean and Air, Professor Manish Thakur, and Dean and Academy, Ms. Dr. Bhaskar Chakraborty, to please occupy the seats on the dais. Thank you so much, sir, for your gracious presence here. We request Dean NIR Professor Manish Thakur to please introduce to the Arijit Mukherjee Memorial Lecture Series. On behalf of I am Calcutta and uh, Arijit Mukherjee Memorial Endowment Fund, I welcome you all to this sixth annual lecture. Some seven years back, in uh, 2015, Late Prashant Kumar Mukherjee and late Srimati Radha Mukherjee, they donated an endowment of approximately 60 lakhs to IIM Calcutta to institute this memorial lecture. And since uh, 2016, we have been having this annual memorial lecture. And so this is our sixth lecture. Now, as I was talking to Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. late Dr. Mukherjee, he was not one of our alumni. And that's why what is noteworthy is that even though he was not one of our alumni, his family thought of Iron Calcutta as an institution of reputation in the city and made this endowment. So this is again uh, on behalf of Iron Calcutta, this is again uh, the opportunity, the moment to express our gratitude to the family of late Dr. Arjit Mukherjee. A few words about uh, Dr. Arjit Mukherjee would be appropriate here. Uh, I have read about him uh, and also I have heard my predecessors talk about him. Dr. Mukherjee was born in Calcutta in 1962 and he passed away at a very early age of 38 in 2000. But even in the short span of 38 years, he he had acquired fame as a prolific academic and that's not my area but I learned that he has some 15 accomplished papers in the top accounting and economics journals and his major work was in the domain of experimental economics and also Dr. Moore would appreciate he published many papers uh, in the realm of auditing incentives and things like that. And what is more interesting that after having acquired his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in 1991, uh, he taught for almost seven years uh, till his untimely death in 2000 in the University of Minnesota. And in these seven years, uh, he had this reputation of being a legendary teacher. I am not going to list out all the awards and the honors that he got as a legendary teacher. So many awards came his way in the short time of seven years and all that. And more interestingly, uh, late Dr. Ajit Mukherjee, he comes out, turns out to be a man of multiple talents. He was also a poet, a published poet, which I would appreciate. In fact, uh, after his death, uh, his posthumous, posthumous publication uh, of the collection of poetry is titled The Young Magician and Other Poems. So you see here is a person who was equally at home in the quantitative world of experimental economics, auditing and design and incentives, but he also had the other talent of being a poet. So to pay our tribute to the memory of this brilliant academic, this multifaceted talent, and also to express our gratitude as an institution to the family of uh, the late Dr. Ajit Mukherjee, especially again I will name his parents, who were generous enough, kind enough to give us this endowment, late Prashant Kumar Mukherjee and late Srimati Anuradha Mukherjee. Uh, we have this lecture and every year we have been holding this lecture and this year this lecture is being delivered by Dr. Nasheed Mo. Uh, and now uh, I invite our director, Professor Uttam Sarkar, 
to welcome you formally on behalf of the SU and also to introduce the chief guest of the day, Dr. Ms. Keith Moore, and then invite him for the lecture. Professor Sagar. Dr. Nochiket Moore, Chief Guest and Speaker this evening for Varjit Mukherjee Memorial Lecture and also the 32nd <laughs> Institute Lecture Series. Professor Bhaskar Chaturburti, Dean Academic, Professor Manish Thakur, respected my faculty colleagues, staff colleagues, alumni, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome you all to this evening. You are aware to this Institute Lecture Series we <coughs> try to get very distinguished speakers from all over the world, certainly from the country, who have made notable contributions to the country or other places and share their thoughts, their achievements, their ideas, opinions with our beloved students and I am Calcutta Fraternity. So we are extremely grateful that for this evening Professor Najee Keth Moore has so kindly agreed to deliver this lecture. Thank you, Dr. Moore. <coughs> Although many of you will be knowing about Dr. Moore, it's my present duty to say a few words about Dr. Moore. He will be delivering the talk on reimagining India's health systems. Given our population, we are discussing with it. And the ground reality, there could hardly be a topic which is uh, more timely and more useful for us. Dr. Rajik Moore is a trained economist. His current work is principally focused on the design of national and regional health systems. He is a visiting scientist at the Banyan Academy of Leadership in Mental Health and Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Information Technology and Public Policy at TIT Bangalore. He is also a commissioner on the Lancet Commission on Reimagining India's Health System. In March 2016, he took over as head of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's India Country Office and served in that position until March 2019. Dr. Moore was born into a farming family in Evatmal, Maharashtra. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from Mumbai University. He has a master's degree in management from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, where he was a classmate of Dr. Raghuram Rajan. He also has a PhD in Economics from the University of Pennsylvania with a specialization in Finance from Wharton School. After completing MBA, he joined a non-government organization called Pradhan where he worked with mushroom farmers. He was then recruited by Mr. K.B. Kamath for ICICI Bank in 1987. In mid-90s, he left a, to do his PhD at Wharton School and returned back to India. In late 2007, he left ICICI Bank to head the newly founded ICICI Foundation for Inclusive Growth to Rural Development. In May 2009, Intuit appointed Dr. Moore to its India Advisory Board. In September 2010, he left the foundation to work with an organization called Sugha Bhajhu, in Tamil it means for happy life, which works to provide better health care to villagers. In May 2013, he was appointed as a director in the Central Board of Reserve Bank of India and its local board in the Eastern area. In September 2013, Committee on Comprehensive Financial Services for Small Businesses and Low Income Households was formed, which was headed by Dr. Najiket Moore. In 2013, he was included in the four member RBI panel led by Dr. Bimal Jalan, which examined applications for new bank licenses. This is few of his many achievements and contributions. I am sure all of us are eagerly awaiting Dr. Moore's talk, so without wasting any more time, it's my present duty and my pleasure to request Dr. Naziket Moore to address the audience. <laughs> Director of the Institute, the Honorable Deans that are here, senior faculty members and uh, students. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, uh, to be with you, um, and to share with you some of my work and some of my thinking on the health systems issues. Um, I will warn you that it's an academic environment, so this is a long and meandering talk. Uh, I 
I'm hoping that it will be aging to you. It's a problem that I was sharing with the director uh, that really um, occupies a lot of our thinking today. And particularly, I don't know what your individual family's experience with COVID-19 was, but it was a devastating time uh, for us as a country. Uh, and it did not respect class, caste, you know, tuberculosis. We lose a thousand people every day. But yet, it doesn't attract the attention that COVID-19 did because the tuberculosis deaths are concentrated amongst the poor and amongst people that perhaps we don't normally engage with and talk about. But COVID-19 did not have that, that boundary and, and hurt everybody uh, quite severely. Um, I was closely involved in COVID-19 relief work uh, in various capacities that I have and I got an opportunity to work with the remotest parts of the country. Uh, and, and really the horror of it all was quite stark. And, and I don't want to debate with you what the right numbers are, what the wrong numbers are, but whatever it is, it was quite a wake up call. And what I thought, and most of my work over the last decade um, has been focused on health systems, trying gradually to understand where do we go as a country? What do we do about this issue? So I, I hope I will be able to give you a sense of some of these issues. But first of all, I do want to uh, thank the Institute for inviting me uh, to speak at this memorial lecture. As was said earlier, uh, Dr. Mukherjee was a prolific scholar and a brilliant teacher. Um, and it's an honor to be asked to speak uh, in a speech of his, uh, in, 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 in a lecture organized in his memory. His field was, of work was experimental economics, in a way parallel a little bit to the work I do, and incentive issues, which are core to his work. You know, as you know, um, finance and accounting specifically is all about uh, signaling uh, and what are we doing to resolve information asymmetries. And you will see uh, from my uh, remarks that a lot of healthcare is actually, strangely enough, a different field, but about information asymmetries, but not quite so clear what do we do about resolving them. Uh, and, and certainly uh, he was known for his rigor and his mathematics. Um, I am not a brilliant teacher or a prolific scholar, but I will try to be as rigorous as I can be in my remarks and, and in my thinking on healthcare. And I would request you, uh, you know, if there is time later or maybe later on, uh, to challenge me on uh, some of these ideas. One of the issues that we are facing in India, and that's a curious situation we have, we spend about 3.3% of our GDP on uh, health as a country. Many will argue, and if you look at examples of countries like Thailand in our neighborhood, that this is enough money to give good healthcare services to the entire country. But yet, the reality is that we do not feature even in the top 100 countries uh, in terms of health outcomes. Um, measured by, there are many measures that are used, one of the measures that become popular um, is called uh, DALIs, disability adjusted life years that are lost. It's a combination of lives that are lost and disabilities like schizophrenia, for example, um, the DALI index counts it as, if you are a schizophrenic that doesn't have treatment, then you're only 30% alive. So while you're living a full life, your number of years that you're living is reduced by 70% uh, to actually calculate uh, what is the uh, life years that are lost. So just, just an intuitive sense of what that number is, it brings that together and as I was sharing earlier in our discussions, countries like Rwanda, Ghana, Kenya uh, have shot ahead of us uh, in terms of performance uh, on, on some of these parameters. And, and it's not just an issue of health outcomes. If I look, for example, at the amount of money people are spending out of pocket to serve and to meet their own health needs, uh, it's an unusually high number that we see. It varies from 70 to 80 percent in a state like Kerala uh, to a low of maybe 50 to 60 percent in a state like Himachal. But both numbers uh, are actually extremely large. The third parameter by which we measure health systems is how responsive are they. If I go to, a, to deliver a baby or to uh, deal with the problem that I have, how does the system respond to me? It's a little bit different metric from customer satisfaction because sometimes you can get good bedside manner but you don't actually get good health outcomes. 
India does very, very poorly on that. You know, in the paper, and I'm hoping you'll get a copy of the speech, I have given extensive citations of whatever I'm saying. Uh, violence against women in facilities where they go to deliver babies is at an all-time high. Uh, they are beaten, uh, they are slapped uh, to prevent them from screaming, from, to prevent them from expressing their anguish when they are delivering their babies. So on all the three parameters that we count good health systems, we are doing particularly poorly. Unfortunately, one of the issues, you know, sometimes we have this belief, growth will solve all. And if I look at poverty, if I look at, you know, lives of people, I used to be, as a young banker, go to Mirzapur in Eastern UP for some work. And, you know, 25 years ago, you would see women, long lines of women standing for a 500 rupee loan. You go today, unless you are prepared to talk about 50,000 rupees as a loan, nobody will show up for a group meeting, nobody will show up to an MFI uh, conversation. So there has been, you know, a rising tide that has lifted boats, even in some of our most remote parts. In fact, pre-COVID-19, COVID-19 has changed things quite a bit, but pre-COVID-19, the belief was that by 2025, if I look at a number like $2 a day, number of people below that number, that number in India would be zero. And that we would have conquered, you know, finally, this issue of stark poverty. Unfortunately, this has not translated into good health outcomes. Um, and one of the issues that puzzles people is that why is that? Why are we seeing, uh, you know, good health outcomes not follow, um, uh, you know, automatically economic development? There are two issues that I think are important to bear in mind. One is that we as consumers are not the best custodians of our own health. Think about it. If you go to buy toothpaste, you know what you want and you are now looking at multiple products and trying to make a decision which gives you the best value for the money that you are going to put out. <coughs> health is a fundamental problem. When I go to a doctor, I do not know what is wrong with me. Right? It's a very different conversation from buying toothpaste. Since I don't know what is wrong with me, I don't know the value of the service being provided to me. I'm not able to ex ante, you know, assess is this the right conversation or is that the right conversation? And remember, health is a lifetime impact. You might get aggressive antibiotic treatments today, but you find five years later, you become immune to the antibiotics you needed when you needed them indeed for a serious disease that you encountered. Right? So it's a problem, but unfortunately, the flip side of that is not true. The provider is responding in a standard economic way to incentives. It's a point that was made very famously by Mark Pauly when he challenged uh, Arrow. Uh, Arrow 1963 is a seminal paper in health economics. Um, Arrow was a young student. Uh, Pauly was a young student at that point and he wrote a letter to the editor. And I'm told it took him five years to muster up the courage to write that letter. Uh, and which was published by the American Economic Review, pointing out this fundamental error that uh, Arrow had made, not recognizing that indeed uh, there are challenges with the way the market is organized and simply intervening with one product or the other was not going to solve it. This is one problem with healthcare. It's not obvious that standard answers are going to give us solutions for it. The second problem with healthcare is that there is a lot of volatility in healthcare expenditures. As you think about education, as you think about clothes, as you think about you know, even buying a home, it's predictable. It's based on your decision, based on what you want to do. Health is not like that. You may encounter low expenditures for years, suddenly get hit with a 20 lakh rupee, 25 lakh rupee shock. Um, and uh, it's not something that you can solve necessarily uh, easily with income transfers or simply growth. You need other tools that are available, but then those tools need to be bought, need to be used in order to make this thing work. Right? And there's evidence that these tools like insurance, for example, are not bought. I am an advisor to the insurance regulator on health insurance. Average age at which people start buying insurance is 45. Right? Because that's when they see mortality in front of them. That's where they worry about young people like you um, are not thinking about it. In fact, there's a very nice paper by Dasgupta and Mishkin that I was sharing earlier in a discussion that shows that we as a race evolved 
with an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex because it, that was needed for our race to survive. And it, it uh, uh, you know, gave us the belief of immortality. If you didn't think you were immortal, you wouldn't cross the road. Right? And unfortunately, that translates into underconsumption of insurance and, of course, primary care and preventive care. So the you know, question is, okay, these are the problems. And you know, I'm not saying anything new. It might be something that you might be hearing for the first time. But this is accepted understanding, accepted literature that I'm citing to you. This is not my own work. Um, the question is, what do we go, you know, about, uh, how do we go about solving it? We know more money uh, is not going to help at an aggregate. How it is spent is going to be important and whose hands, whose hands is money is going to be important. But the aggregate expenditure going up is not necessarily going to give us uh, the best outcomes uh, that we need. In fact, there are examples that I cite of the US, Poland, Croatia, South Africa, different countries at different stages of economic growth, all of them have spent a lot more money than other countries have, but have not gotten good health outcomes uh, from that added expenditure. Where is the hope coming from? There are many countries. For example, the two that I mentioned here, Colombia and Peru, these are countries almost as large as our states. Um, these countries have spent very little money, but have delivered health outcomes that are the envy of the world because they've really thought about design issues much, much more carefully. And most of my work, my research, my publishing is trying to focus on what can we learn from these uh, conversations, what can we learn from what's happening on the ground in India, and how do we you know, bring this magic together uh, to, to make things happen. Some ideas that I've been working on that I would suggest, these are not necessarily the ideas, or ideas that won't change over time. But you know, since I, I'm sharing some of this work with you, it's also going to feature in the Lancet Commission's report. Um, I thought I might discuss them with you, debate them with you, see what you think. One of the issues that dogs us a little bit is our history as a nation. We began life in 1947 as a country under a certain economic, social, structure. In healthcare, we adopted, following many parts of the world, uh, a model which is known as the Samashko model. This model was designed uh, by uh, Dr. Samashko, Alexandrovich Samashko. He was the health minister of Stalin and Lenin, uh, and he built this model. This model, in the classic style of old world Russia, was a low trust model. The belief was that if we are not careful, people will run away with our money. And it was a model designed uh, on what we call nine item budgets. Every health facility was told how many syringes can you buy, how many gloves can you buy, how many tables, chairs will, have, will you have. And you know, if you see the line items, they ran into thousands. Uh, that was the budgeting process of Alexandrovich Samashko. And he built a whole health system using that broad thinking. The challenge with that approach was outcomes were nowhere in featured in the health system because you know his entire thinking and the entire thinking at that point was that I need to worry about my own teams, my own staff cheating me and running away with syringes and gloves and tables and chairs and that was my primary purpose. India has remained strongly wedded to the Samashko model. Uh, if you look at today's health systems anywhere in the country, they follow the Samashko blueprint very, very tightly within the government. In fact, all health systems that are high performing, including that of Russia today, and of all the previous Russian USSR, Soviet Union countries, they have abandoned the uh, Samashko model. The, the blueprint that has emerged has come to us from Mrs. Thatcher, uh, which is, you know, broadly defined called strategic purchasing. What it does is, it basically switches the trust element to say, you are good people, you have a good idea what to do. I'm not going to micromanage how you spend your money. Will you buy gloves? Will you buy syringes? What will you do with it? I will, however, hold you accountable for the outcomes that you get from the expenditure uh, that you have. Um, in fact, Mrs. Thatcher 
went the full distance and created what we call a purchaser provider split in which the Ministry of Health was denied a budget, was told no money for you. You are a public sector entity intent on providing healthcare services. The money will go to a separate entity called the National Health Service Trust, NHS Trust. The trust will buy from you services that you are able to provide based on services that you actually provide. Most recently, Thailand, you know, in 2002, uh, implemented this approach, uh, created something called the National Health Security Office, uh, in which they did exactly this. They took all the money away from ministries of health and transferred them to the NHSO and told the ministries that now you will get money, not through a budget, but on the basis of outcomes that you deliver. In fact, as it's turning out now, there are no good health systems left that stay with this national model. Um, it's a dramatic change. Uh, it requires a political will uh, that is there. The good thing in India at the state level is that there is enormous anti-incumbency uh, in the political form. You know, even in Tamil Nadu, you know, Jailalita, the powerful chief minister that she was, held power only once in 10 years. She lost every election that she stood as a chief minister uh, because that's the nature of the beast. Um, even in the center, while it is true that there is a single political party in power for an extended period, if you look at the number of legislators and look at the composition of the parliament, actually 75% of people are new. The same people are not showing up again and again gives us an opportunity for political change, but needs uh, a lot of work uh, to make it happen. Clearly, this is one important thing that needs to be done. And I can't see a shortcut around. Because, you know, sometimes when you see a mountain, you tend to think, well, why don't I work around it? Why don't I find a way? Why do I need to climb the mountain and solve the problem? What if I can't climb it? I'm not able to see an exception to this rule if the government wishes to continue to be a provider of healthcare services with whatever money is prepared to provide. The second area is we spend 3.3% uh, of our GDP on healthcare, but only a third of that money comes via the government. The rest of the money comes from our pockets uh, when we go out to buy healthcare services. And for a variety of reasons, you know, partly due to what I said earlier, that we as consumers can't be trusted to look after ourselves. So if you told me, I'm giving you money, you go and figure out what is good health care for you, very likely you will end up in a situation where you will build an economy with excess supply of hospitals, uh, reduced supply of primary care, virtually no preventive care. Right? It's not a surprise, it's not that we are idiots, that we are fools. This is how consumers the world over behave. Um, and we will end up uh, doing that. One of the reasons why people say give the money away to the government uh, or let the government spend it because partly there's an equity issue, you know, the second welfare theorem, but really partly the problem is the first welfare theorem, which is you do not get Pareto optimality if you are simply allowing uh, markets to function in, a, in, a, in an unfettered manner. Now, new research, you know, we don't know whether it will stand the test of all the reviews that me and my co-authors are involved in winding his way through the Lancet machinery, um, we find that actually things are a little bit better and worse than we had imagined. It turns out that Indian cost advantages are such that for a number far lower than what the world imagines is needed, we think we can offer universal health care to all our citizens. We also find that there isn't that much difference between the states. You know, we look at, for example, nursing salaries in Bihar, in UP, in Kerala, in you know Manipur, in Maharashtra. There is not that much of a difference. We also find that if you talk about a nurse uh, and how much she costs us, a registered nurse, annual salary is about two lakh rupees. Is what you will get a registered nurse for in India. The same registered nurse in the same background in the U.S cost $80,000, giving you an implied exchange rate of roughly 3, three rupees per dollar. And in fact, the 3 rupees number shows up if you compare open heart surgeries, 
Narayan Vidyale Mayo College, a Mayo Clinic uh, in the US, you'll see this number of three to five emerge from all of these. Coming back to the suggestion that maybe around a number of 2,000 rupees per capita is enough to deliver UHC uh, to uh, our populations. There are 12 Indian states that's in which the government already spends more than this money. Today, Kerala, Goa, Delhi, Himachal, um, Uttarakhand, all of the northeastern states except Assam, they already spend more than this money. If they don't get UHC, we argue that it is because of the first problem that I mentioned. They are misspending the money and doing a very poor job of it. Just to give you an example, Kerala government does cesarean sections. The WHO benchmark is 15%. About a sixth of women will need surgical uh, intervention in order to have a baby. 85% of women will need nothing. They will just need support. Uh, you know, but they will not need an uh, emergency surgery. 15% will need it. Against that, a state like Bihar does 3 to 4%, clearly underdoing it, but a state like Kerala does 60%. In districts like Arnakulam, for example, it outdoes the private sector in terms of unnecessary C sections. And I'm just talking about C section, I'm not talking about knee replacements or cabbage or so many other surgeries that actually happen that are not necessary, but are happening for a variety of reasons. But it tells you resources are being used in ways which are inconsistent with the best health outcomes uh, that are needed. By contrast, there is a very nice uh, set of papers for Kerala and for Karnataka uh, by Sunil Nadraj and others, uh, which shows that primary care facilities in a state like Kerala are virtually empty. One patient a month, one patient a, uh, a week, uh, that's the number. And this is using government's own records, which I would imagine are overstated relative to what is actually going on in the system. Okay. It's possible that there is the extent of waste is so high in these systems uh, because of this annual budgeting process that kept on increasing the amount of money without asking for any outcomes that you didn't get any designs. Unfortunately though, the number of 2,000 also means that a state like Bihar, that is spending only 400 rupees per capita, now needs to multiply its health expenditure by five times in order to come close to offering universal health care. Currently, it allocates 5% of its budget on health. If you want to get to UHC, they'll have to allocate 25% of their uh, budget to health. Right? Clearly, they need to find the money from somewhere, either from central grants or from their own resources. Now, whenever you go to the government, I have gone, you know, I used to work with Gates Foundation, Bill Gates and I went to meet Mr. Jetley, and Bill, whenever he is in India, one of his constant refrains to the finance ministry is, your health ministry needs more money from you. Why don't you give it uh, to them? Mr. Jetley told us that, Mr. Gates, India does not have the tax base to support it. Our tax to GDP ratio is only about 15 to 16%, if you compare us with, say, Brazil, which is 35%, or Sweden, which is 65%, you know, we don't have the money that they are able to produce. Well, it turns out, Thailand has a tax GDP ratio identical to ours. What it does, we spend 5% of our budget on health, it spends 15% of its budget on health. Iran, despite its all revenues, has 7% tax GDP ratio. So it's even less. It spends 21% of its budget on health. In fact, Iran has one of the best health outcomes uh, in our neighborhood uh, in terms of uh, health by using a number of uh, strategies that they have deployed on the ground. Clearly, government needs to spend more money on this. Unfortunately, this is not a new story. You know, for people like me who've been at it for a long time, uh, this is a constant refrain. You, you read committee reports from the 1940s, you will hear the same refrain, government needs to come up with more money. Uh, why are we not getting more money from the government? We have two problems. Right? We looked at global literature. There's a whole series of papers coming out from the Center for Social and Economic Progress in Delhi, uh, which looks at this question quite carefully to see why is India not doing it and what can we learn from other countries 
in which these allocations have actually happened. In India, one problem we are running, and we are back to our founding fathers, uh, the desire of the government to stay in business is a very powerful desire. They wish to engage in markets long after there is a rationale for them to engage in those markets. You know, we've all heard about agricultural subsidies, power subsidies, uh, interference in banking, uh, so many sectors. There is no role for the government in any of those sectors. The logic of the 1940s where there were no Tata's, there were no Billas, there were no Ambani's, there were no Adani's, that you needed the government to step up is no longer true. I was a banker for 25 years. My background is in project finance. Um, institutions like ICICI, for example, are easily able to fund a large proportion of the development requirements uh, of the country. There is no real reason why the government must be allocating tax resources for it. Government at some level is aware of this, but its desire to stay in business is an overpowering desire, and that will take time to actually uh, change. The second reason that you see where countries have moved is that, for example, if you look at Thailand and Indonesia, they went through the East Asian crisis, and their economies just sank um, from a, a trajectory that they were on much earlier. Vietnam, our neighbor, you know, the breakup of the Soviet Union was a big shock. Uh, on the development trajectory of Vietnam. Brazil went through its own financial crisis. These crises produced a level of sudden awareness of poverty and underdevelopment in the economy that needed a new bunch of politicians to emerge. That made a new promise to the uh, electorate. And many times that promise was about basic services, including health. In fact, Thailand, you know, the story is that it was a week, a tumultuous, extremely important week, in which the country went from having very poor health care, health care to universal health care, in terms of design. It took them a long time to implement it, but today they are, they have a model that is the envy of the world. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those circumstances. We don't have a big crisis. One could imagine COVID was a crisis of that sort, but the economy has a resilience that brought us back to some semblance of balance uh, and didn't produce the kind of disaster that you might have seen elsewhere. So really, a whole new class of politicians has not emerged from these crises that are asking for change, willing for change. What can we do? What are the areas? So again, evidence shows, and if you look at Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu as two states in India, and examples of Turkey, is that don't dream big about getting these problems solved by the government. Start incrementally. If people see small improvements in healthcare, they will reward politicians in a small way, and hopefully that will build momentum <coughs> as we uh, go forward. The other area, of course, it's an area many people are engaged in, I'm engaged in as well, is to try and find growth-oriented politicians. People who really care about poverty, people who care about economic growth, to say to them that the current development strategy of state and central governments, which are interfering in markets, is hurting economic growth. There is a paper by Reserve Bank of India that shows that poor capital allocation by the public sector has reduced economic growth to GDP by 2% per year. Right? This is the cost of the Samashko style commanding heights perspective that you have to acknowledge. If you want the economy to grow, stop interfering in it. Participate in those sectors where your interference will actually add value, but withdraw from those sectors where uh, you are actually hurting the economy by participating. There are a number of other one of the issues that you might ask is, you know, uh, what about the private sector? So far I've spoken about the government. What can we do about the private sector? Now there are again several lessons that we can learn from the rest of the world. One important issue that we need to be conscious of is what is happening to the private sector in India. Give or take, depending on who you talk to, Indian aggregate healthcare expenditure ranges between somewhere 8 to 10 lakh crores. Let's stay with the number of 10 lakh crores, makes the math a little bit easier. Right? 
the aggregate share of the corporate sector in that entire amount is under 5%. In my 25 years of banking and project finance, I have never seen a sector in which the corporate sector is such a tiny portion of the market. In fact, if you add up the top lines of Fortis, Apollo, Manipal, NH, all the large corporate hospitals, it is smaller than the top line of Henry Ford, which is a small, mid-sized health system in Detroit. Both are roughly about 5 to 6 billion dollars. It's an unusually low market share. Why is that? You know, why is it that these corporate giants, because I come from a background in which people like Mr. Kamat, who hired me, and me, Chanda, several colleagues of mine, we took a bank that was about 2,000 crores balance sheet size to a 15 lakh crore balance sheet size. Right? In the same period, then these hospitals went and have ended up today with 1,500 crores, 2,000 crores. Why such lack of ambition? Why so little traction? I actually teach a course on this at the Indian School of Business on Health Systems Design where I delve into this specific question. One of the challenges, there are many, but one of the challenges is that, you know, if I take the language of banking and project finance, right, we know, we know that a business that has high operating leverage, high financial leverage, the only way that math can work is if it has low revenue volatility. Right? Only then can you take all these fixed costs and actually service them and grow your business. Banking is a business like that. High operating leverage, high financial leverage, but virtually no revenues. Even if you say, oh my god, NBAs have become very big, they are 3%. Right? It's a very low revenue uncertainty, which is what allows this business to sustain. In healthcare, unfortunately, you get high leverage operating, high leverage financial, therefore high total leverage, very high revenue volatility, which means these businesses have to be equity financed. They cannot be financed by debt. They cannot do. You have to bring revenue volatility down. The only way to do it is to stop running your hospitals like WeWork spaces in which you build a big mall and you get hospitals, their doctors, fancy doctors to come and act as consultants uh, to do it. You go to any hospital today in the city of Calcutta, you'll find they have no electronic health records, they have no idea who you are. I'd be surprised if they knew anything beyond your name and your address because they need that to collect the 400 rupees you owe them. They have no idea about anything else that's going on. The direction in which many health systems have gone, and Israel at a national level, and in the US, which is somewhat similar to our health system, you know, somewhat better state than ours, but somewhat similar, at a subnational level, systems have gone in a direction which is called managed care, in which what you do is you start to work with consumers from, yes, they say cradle to tomb. You do not work with them only when they happen to need a liver transplant. And that's the time you show up and say, come to Apollo or come to NH. You work with them from the minute they are born to their entire life cycle. This needs some work on the regulation front, which Clearly something needs to work on, but it needs a different mindset on the part of the provider system and perhaps an entirely new breed of healthcare providers. I'm hoping some of you, as you begin your journeys to get your job, build your startups, build your enterprises, you will think afresh uh, in, in, in these areas. Another uh, uh, you know, opportunity for us is to expand access to voluntary insurance. I was a member of a committee appointed by the insurance regulator uh, in which we were asked to look at this question. Why is the insurance market in India not expanding? It's about 7% uh, of the market. In Brazil has 40%, US has 80%. Why are we stuck at 7%? It turns out that we have imposed a 100 crore minimum capital requirement on setting up a new insurance company in India. France requires 15 crores. Now, why is it that a poor developing country like ours has such a punitive capital requirement when a much more advanced and much richer country has a much lower capital requirement? This is inconsistent with what you see in banking, what you see in any other sector. Right? We have much lower requirements than what is needed to set up an institution of a comparable size in the US or other parts of the world. We pointed this out to the insurance regulator and said to them, at least drop it to the French levels. 
you know, do not insist because you can't take the position as a Ministry of Finance that we will not give you more money for health because we don't have enough tax GDP ratio. But we will also not allow you to set up insurance companies because we want to protect the public sector. Because if so many new players come in, then public sector will lose market share. Right? Ultimately, somebody has to wake up and say, let's think about the people. How are they going to get financial protection if neither of these tools are available to them? My understanding from what I hear, you know, but I hear things that I want to hear, not necessarily what is going to happen, is that this proposal is slowly winding its way through the corridors of power and we might actually see some positive development uh, on that. You know, you might say, well, these are all great ideas, you know, you need to work on them and get people out. But maybe, maybe we are sitting in a situation where nothing is going to change. Government is not going to come up with more money. The insurance regulation is not going to change. The corporate sector is not going to suddenly become more ambitious. You know, my request to some of these CEOs, who I know for many, many years because of my work as a banker with them, is to be more greedy. Try to make more money. You know, why are you satisfied with 50 crores, 100 crores of profits? There are other business houses in India that are making 20,000 crores of profits per quarter and they're still not satisfied. How come you are so happy with the 100 crore bottom line? Right? I mean, that's the kind of number that we are talking about. But, you know, I could talk all I want. We might not get any traction from that. We may be left in an environment where there is out-of-pocket payment uh, and 70-80% of the people are doing what they've always been doing, which is going out to seek health care. Even there, there is an opportunity for us to do a lot more. For example, today, if I look at the example, if I look at the uh, countries like Portugal, Indonesia, South Africa, different economics, different uh, income levels, different political structures, they all, for example, have embraced the pharmacy as a primary care provider. The reality of today's India is we have 800,000 pharmacies. In fact, there is one nice paper that came out of Ujjain which showed that per 100,000 density of pharmacies in India is one of the highest in the world. You know, what they say, if you go to Scandinavia, every second shop is a sports shop. You go to any part of India, any sec every second shop is a medicine shop. Right? So we have a huge population of pharmacies. Many countries have converted that problem into an opportunity. And have started to work with pharmacies to say, why don't you help me manage non-communicable why don't you help me manage diabetes? Why don't you help me manage hypertension? Because it's something you can do, you have the medicines, you know how to administer them. Why don't I offer you a six month diploma, one year diploma to make something like this happen? In fact, under the new telemedicine guidelines, uh, there is a lot we can do even today with pharmacies. And I'm happy to tell you there are many interesting startups, you know, uh, organized by people, young people like you that I'm talking to that are trying to figure out what to do. Another group that I'm working with, they took a different tack. They realized that the education arena, which is primary, secondary, you know, uh, higher secondary education, has become much more of a private affair than it used to be several years ago. Now, I'm not going to opine on is that good for education or not, but that's the reality that we are seeing today. A startup out of Coimbatore. Uh, run by you know, a, a, a woman entrepreneur decided to start to talk to these low cost private schools and say why don't I set up primary care clinics inside your school right? so that all your children can be served she is growing like a rocket because all these schools are looking for a competitive edge over somebody else she is bringing highly protocol driven health care to the children under her care she currently has 200,000 children that are under her care uh, she is growing very, very fast. In fact, as a banker, I worry perhaps too fast uh, because if demand is there, I want to make sure her systems are in place, her protocols are in place, you know, a simple area, for example, to worry about fever or unknown origin, right? It's a common thing that you see. People show up with a fever, you have no idea what the heck is going on with this person, right? How do I treat fevers of unknown origin? In, in particularly where her schools are, which are rural, semi-urban areas, scrub typhus is an important issue, leptospirosis is an important issue, but yet you don't find medical providers actually engaging with them. So the excitement of that, and now I'm talking to her about, you know, one of my interest areas is mental disorders, mental health. Uh, I, I also teach another course in public mental health. 
we are talking about autism, we are talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we are talking about conduct disorders. Uh, in children, schools are very, very interested in these issues. Parents are very interested in these issues. Right? Her clinics are becoming the channel uh, through which uh, we can go forward. There is no government here, all payments are happening out of pocket, no insurance regulation has changed, but yet the building blocks of what future of healthcare might look like is starting to emerge uh, from uh, you know, uh, such enterprises. And it gives me great comfort. In fact, I often uh, meet young people like you um, at conferences, in individual discussions about the ideas that they're working on. And some of them are just electrifying ideas. You know, and they're, they're taking an objective reality. Me, uh, my head is in the clouds. I'm thinking about big systems change, state governments changing, politicians changing. They're not thinking about it. They are saying, I've got a problem here, I have an opportunity here, what can I do to convert that into something beneficial? And as I told you from the few examples that I saw, uh, there is indeed stuff that they are doing that can actually have a pretty powerful impact. <laughs> to conclude, what I want to say, say is that we are in a bad position. We are not improved. If you see the last 10, 20 years, our rank in the League of Nations on healthcare domains is only falling. Uh, and if you are not careful, this can become one of the biggest impediments in our code. One of the, I live in Bangalore. What was shocking to me is that when 2019-20 data came out on nutrition outcomes for the city of Bangalore, stunting, which was already severe stunting, which is you know what we call severe acute malnutrition, uh, where children are at risk of dying, which is five times higher than a normal child. That number, which was already 7 to 8%, has shot up to 11% in the city of Bangalore. Right? When people get upset that the Global 100 Index is painting us poorly, I don't think they're looking at our own data. Because if the city of Bangalore can do so poorly, I don't know the data for Kolkata. My suspicion is it's doing as badly uh, in terms of delivering uh, health outcomes. So the situation is really not good. And simply waiting is not going to help us. We will have more automobiles, we will have more scooters, more cars, more people will fly in planes and all of those benchmarks are very nice benchmarks. But they will not actually have good health outcomes. Kerala, a state that we all look up to from health outcomes, it has the highest burden of dyslipidemia, which is cholesterol. It has the highest burden of hypertension, that is blood pressure. It has a suicide mortality rate six times higher than UK. Right? So we are not a developed nation like UK, but we are already paying a penalty that is multiples and a lot of that suicide is concentrated in young people because again variety of reasons uh, that are going on uh, in a state like Kerala. Much of this we can fix, much of this we know what to do about but it needs action to happen. What I have tried to outline are some ideas that I am working on uh, to try and bring some of this stuff into different conversations. These are not ideas coming at us from the WHO or the World Bank or from international foundations. In fact, one of the things I requested the director is that institutions of eminence like I am Calcutta, I am doing this something similar with I am Udaipur, with I am Vizag, uh, I am Indore, uh, to try and see if we can take the initiative, we can start to convince and work with not just necessarily the government, government is just one of the many actors on what is needed to be done to fix the state of health systems in our state, in our location, and in our locality. Uh, because I think it's fixable. I think there are good ideas we have on the table. We are not South Sudan. We have enough money. Uh, we have enough technological capability. I have a paper that I wrote on the use of artificial intelligence for public health, for you know, surveillance, disease surveillance, bad population tracking. You know, what is going on with bad population in Chhattisgarh? I was the head of a task force for the government of Chhattisgarh on their health systems design. You go to Raipur, you will see tiny bat populations, you know, stuck under houses and, um, you know, small buildings. We know that's a bad sign. Bat populations should be living in throngs of one lakh in remote forests. They should not be roosting in cities like this, which means it's a population under stress, it's shedding viruses, and the possible possibility of zoonotic spillover goes up in a state like that. We don't have the resources that America has to set up surveillance centers on the ground, but we have satellite capability. 
uh, which can allow us to see things much, much more carefully. Machine learning can allow us to decipher what we are seeing in a way that ground, ground level work just cannot do. So we have a lot of strengths. We have a lot of capabilities uh, that can convert these opportunities into something very new. It needs to be done though, and it needs concerted effort on both on the part of you know young people trying to build businesses, build careers, and academic institutions like this one to bring that magic together. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Moore, for such an illuminating lecture. As we have this convention of taking few questions after the lecture, and we have uh, approximately 10 minutes, so I invite maybe two or three questions from the audience. I think someone is going around with the mic, so you can just raise your hand and uh, just ask your question. Good evening, Doctor, and thank you for the wonderful talk. I was just going to the nitty gritty of the ideas and I was just trying to understand. So the first idea that you mentioned was about uh, how uh, a central trust can be instituted and the ministry can send the funding for that. So now you said that it would be outcome driven. I'm trying to understand the credibility of the institution giving this outcome. If the ministry itself is giving a report on the outcomes, then uh, I'm just thinking like how do we tackle that problem because if the ministry is being paid for those outcomes and the other one reporting those outcomes. That's the first question. Second was about your another idea, which was about essentially creating a central repository with the idea that uh, we tend to one person from their crib to their tomb. So now uh, understanding who gets to access this database and who gets to fill information within this database. So for example, in the rural villages, if we have Anganwadi or if we have, uh, uh, let's say, any doctor who's visiting these rural places, then how how does credible information enter there and how is it accessed? That's my question. No, I think these are both very good questions. So the idea, and you know, I, we can only see what others have done to learn from it, is that it's not the Ministry of Health that does both functions. The National Health uh, Service Trust in the UK, the National NHSO in Thailand, the NSO in Turkey, these are all independent organizations, typically under the control directly of the Chief Minister uh, and the Finance Ministry. Uh, because these are people that are funding the um, Health Ministry. Health Ministry becomes an entity that is, you know, the Ministry itself may retain a policy role, but its public sector delivery function becomes like ONGC, like the power, uh, you know, uh, grid corporation, which is a delivering organization. That is the entity that gets paid uh, for these services. And we don't need to do it at the central level. This is actually can be done and needs to be done at the state level because the state realities are very different. And fortunately, with the long years of experience we have had with, you know, uh, RSBY and now with this new scheme uh, called Ayushman Bharat, we have the purchasing capability. We have the insurance, this is what insurance companies do. They receive money from consumers and they buy healthcare services. Okay? So we have the raw capacity to do it. It's more a matter of setting up that structure and saying to the Ministry of Health that you no longer will get a budget. You will get money region by region based on your performance. Now the second question you have is, well, who will measure the performance? Who will capture the data? Now the reality is that if an outcome focused entity is saying I am going to give you money only on the basis of outcomes, it's not that the doctor himself is going to be capturing data. In the UK for example, a UK GP receives a large bonus if hypertension levels in his community are below a certain benchmark. This is measured independently of that GP. Good thing about measurement is you can use samples, you can use you know multiple techniques to track uh, what is going on in the community, you don't need to uh, necessarily um, rely on just the data collected by the doctor themselves. So again, I'm not going to tell you I have all the solutions, but the good thing about both these ideas is that many countries have done them. We can go and look at Plan Nasser in Brazil, we can look at the work that has been done in Thailand, work that's been done in Vietnam, 
to try and figure out what is the best practice and what can we learn from it. Look at the example of COVID in India. Right? We do have reasonably accurate data. I mean, you might say, well, people fudged it, this, that, and the other, but there are enough checks and balances. Look at our tax system. You know, we have this popular belief that lots of Indians are not paying taxes, but that's not true. You know, if you look at the number of people that owe taxes and need to pay them, you know, particularly under Dr. Vijay Kelkar, you know, the work that he did in the early 2000s, that leak has been plugged quite dramatically. Uh, so, indeed, these are capabilities we have. We just have to decide we want to deploy them. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful insights. Uh, my name is Satya. So, this might be a candid question, but uh, like you talked about insurance and risk under penetration in the market, right? So, uh, in current, in today's offerings that the insurance companies provide, uh, it does not generally cover you know, outpatient uh, visits or consultations. So, in your view, like how do you see this? Like, how can, at least, what is the importance of insurance cover these areas? In general, like how does insurance, like what, what insurance has positioned in India's care as a whole? Yeah, I, I think it's an important question. Now, one can approach it kind of in two ways. One is kind of a pure finance perspective. From a pure finance perspective, as you know, the logic of insurance comes from the law of large numbers of the central limit theorem. Right? What it tells you is that if you have random variables that are drawn from you know a population with high volatility, right, high sigma, averages of these variables, the rate at which the standard deviation of the average falls is by square root of n. Right? We know this for a fact. Right? And it's relatively easy to see. I mean the simple example uh, you can imagine, if you have not done central limit theorem, is take one dice, try to roll it. The chance of getting one or a two or a three or a six is all equal to one six. Now you take two dice, roll it and ask the question, what is the chance of getting an average of one? An average of two. You can immediately see that central tendency is starting to emerge. Right? To get a one, both dice must have shown a one, then only you get an average of one. To get a seven, you can get a two and a five, three and a four, you know, etc. So, we know that's going to happen, but for that you need volatility. Volat and then there is the administrative cost, because the underlying belief is that a utility maximizing customer, what he's trying to do is, in using a simple quadratic utility, he's trying to reduce volatility um, of his overall uh, consumption set. Right? For hospital expenditure, this works very well. In primary care, the volatility is not there. On average, you will see your doctor three times a year. This is going to happen one way or the other. Right? And it's not a good subject for insurance. In fact, in the jargon, we separate the two. We call what, what I just spoke about earlier for hospitals as pooling. What we talk about for primary care as prepayment. Now, what I'm talking about is to try and bring the healthcare provider involved in this conversation and to say how can I take on both roles, insurer, prepayer and provider. So that now, you know, again just to, you know, since it's an academic environment, you know, to throw another, you know, piece of uh, jargon at you, is the price of the product I'm seeing, is it a sufficient statistic or not? In equity markets it is. If I need to know how well is Reliance doing, I just need to look at its market price. Right? If I want to know how LIC is doing relative to when it listed, I need to look at its market price. I know price is sufficient statistic. In healthcare, if I told you that a C-section costs 20,000 rupees versus 2 lakh rupees, that doesn't tell you anything. It simply tells you, oh my god, you got cheated. Because you didn't really need the C-section in the first place. If you bring these things together into what we call managed care, price starts to become a sufficient statistic. What Israel has done, Israel took the country, broke it into four parts and told four sets of players that you will be insurers and providers at the same time. So once a person has paid you 10,000 rupees a year, they will never pay you anything else. Not for drugs, not for medicine, not for surgery, not for anything else. Now their life is in your hands and you are responsible for their well-being because if you, if they fall sick, you will have to pay. They will not pay. 
and they built a very successful market-oriented system with such an approach. So a pure expansion of indemnity insurance will not help us. Uh, but if we, you know, did a little bit of, you know, kind of complexity and brought some of these ideas together, we may be able to find a solution. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such an insightful talk. Uh, so my question, uh, it's not a question, it's just a thought. Uh, and uh, I was just wondering that, can we use uh, uh, the idea of intermingled lending in the healthcare sector? In the sense that if you uh, basically issue the certificate to all these public institutes, that I you based upon the previous budgets that okay that you have the uh, you have certificate of 100 crores and there will be a heterogeneity that some units have a surplus demand a surplus demand and they will their expense is high other have lower uh, demand and their expense will be low and the surplus unit uh, the deficit unit can basically sell these to the surplus unit then the profit maximization maximizing units that has deficit uh, that has low demand but they are basically expending because they want to fulfill their budget, budget just to say okay then these kind of efficiencies can be gained by these kind of projects uh, i mean that this 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 needs a longer debate but the way healthcare works right, and there is a framework called what i spoke about managed care is another framework called managed competition the problem in healthcare is that the units that you are selling is not profits but risk. For example, if you are somebody that is an insurer in a poor area, you are likely to encounter a lot more infectious disease risk, a lot less um, diabetes and dyslipidemia and hypertension risk. If on the other hand you are an insurer in a rich area, you will encounter a lot more obesity, you will encounter a lot more NCDs, but you will not encounter as much of leptospirosis or uh, scrub typhus. What typically the role the governments play, this is not done bilaterally through exchanges, but governments play is risk equalization. Those entities that are bearing more risk are compensated by the government by charging an excess price to those entities that are bearing less. In Germany, for example, insurers are not allowed to refuse anybody an insurance request. Right? If the person has applied to you, you have to take them on. But the government recognizes that many people that are seeking insurance may be sick or may have gone down a certain pathway in terms of their lifestyle, their behaviors that produce a lot of risk. This risk equalization may be something that similar to what you have in mind allows us to trade risk from one pool to another pool so that you have, now you might argue what about aggregate surplus in the system. I have traded but there is aggregate surplus. Now again there are rules on this, for example in the US if you are an insurer and your claims ratio is less than 80% then at the end of the year the difference between your actual claims ratio and 80% has to be returned to consumers. Uh, you cannot hold on. Uh, so I don't know if that's a helpful response or not, but maybe that's a way to take your idea and do something with it. But frankly, I would encourage all of you to think about these issues afresh and to see what ideas you have. How can we address this issue? You know, old codgers like me, we have figured out something, but we are really relying on backward looking at each. But maybe there are new things that are happening uh, that uh, you know, need attention. But don't forget, as I said earlier, you know, this notion that we as consumers are not necessarily the best arbiters of our own health. So, customer satisfaction, customer focused health systems are bad health systems. Because they end up pushing customers. The problem with, for example, modern telemedicine, you know, you sign on to any of these websites, unfortunately run by many of the giants now, um, they will give you a Diwali sale for complete blood count. I mean, why do I need a Diwali sale for a complete gut count? Right? But they don't understand the business of healthcare. They came from selling clothes and selling peanuts to now suddenly starting to sell healthcare. They're bringing the same thinking to that market, making it worse and worse and worse. At some point, regulators will step up and say, what are you doing? You're hurting people. You're not just not helping. You're actually making lives worse. 
I would invite you go to any of these websites and order a third generation antibody. Some random person will call you, ask you two questions, you give them a rehearsed answer, you'll get a whole pack of third generation antibiotics in your home. I mean, come on. Right? This is not the way healthcare is going to be built. So unfortunately, a lot of the startup momentum has been has taken the fractures, you know, that Rashukta and Mishkin pointed out and have exploited them to build large businesses because we know that we have been weak regulators and they don't know what's going on in the system, which is why they've allowed you, in fact, they are joining you. e Sanjeevni, for example, is a scheme that replicates the private sector idea, which is a bad idea, and puts government machinery behind it right, without a full understanding of what good health systems design is. But equally, there are many opportunities that all of you have to really think from the beginning and come up with something really quite revolutionary and bold that we have not thought about, but you know, it will happen to you. Thank you again. Last question of the day. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> There is a general belief that it was a supplanted question. Don't, don't go by that. <laughs> so firstly, thank you for a very lucid talk. Uh, the education which is written there, that is driving me to ask this question. That it's a Banyan Academy of Leadership and Mental Health. You uh, know from experience, mental health actually is one of the more neglected areas of healthcare. I was just uh, trying to, of course, to perhaps give a separate talk somewhere on this place about this. But what about the general principles you were mentioning about in general health systems? What are some of the things which will apply to mental health and which are some of the things which you need to go different? Well, it's, a, it's a good question and your the point is an important one that mental health is an important issue. My own area of work in mental health is in two fields. I work on suicide and I work on what we call public mental health. Public mental health is preventive mental health. It's not so much about you are sick and you need treatment. That's curative and that's important. I'm not saying it's not important. But I work on the public aspect of it, which is to say, how can I take a room full of people like you and make you all stronger mentally so that you are able to resist the challenges that the world faces, throws at you without succumbing to one disorder or the other. See, this is what I do. I teach a course in public mental health. Uh, this is my work. Now, public mental health and mental health overall is just one component of overall health system. Good primary care. For example, I'll give you an example of a situation in Alaska. Alaska is one of the remotest areas in the planet. Villages are a thousand kilometers apart from each other. Uh, she does. There is no way to travel from one village to the other. They are isolated for years and years. If at all somebody can make a flight They'll go to Anchorage, they'll go to one of the big cities. They will never go to the neighboring village because the neighboring village is a thousand miles away. Yet they have built one of the best health systems in the world. What did they do? They realized that if you are able to bring local community medicines, so they have something called the community health aid program, in which six standard to ten standard pass girls are taught to provide comprehensive primary care, including behavior. A lot of behavioral health, while it has complex manifestations, what one does about them is not that complex. If, for example, you have a behavioral issue, right, we know it's oftentimes you yourself hurting yourself through a script you have in your head. You know, for example, somebody like me, I come in here to give a speech, I'm saying to myself, you're going to mess it up. You're going to fall down, you're going to forget your speech, it's going to be bad. These are automatic scripts that come up, that contribute to anxiety, that contribute to teaching people repeatedly how to, you know, as this new and noise cancelling headphones, to emit, not to say stop thinking that, but to think another thought, which counters that thought and trains you to do, and that is called the behavior therapy. So the solutions, in a way, are not that easy. And what these community health aids are taught is to how do you recognize an issue early and how do you address that issue early in a curative sense. In a preventive sense, we have enormous opportunity. Enormous opportunity. That unfortunately in India, one of the reasons I 
uh, work in that area is people don't even talk about it. When they say mental health, they mean sick people don't get care. They don't mean that how can we prevent people from getting sick in the first place? Schizophrenia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, they inherited disorders. Right? If your first degree relative has schizophrenia, you are more, eight times more likely to be schizophrenic. Now, that's a fact. You know, the evidence seems to be pretty clear. Genetic brain studies are showing this in fact. But we know that exposure to stress in the 14 to 18 year periods is a key driver of somebody who is predisposed to be schizophrenic to become schizophrenic. Now that insight allows us to start early. We already know families that have schizophrenia. We start to work with them and counsel them about how do you deal with the life of this adolescent who's at a very critical stage, uh, you know, to prevent him from becoming schizophrenic. And if he does become schizophrenic, what can we do to quickly respond uh, to that emerging psychosis and address it and deal with it? Lots to be done, sir. Lots to be done. The only thing that I want to leave with the thought here is that well within our class. If a sixth standard girl can do it, right? there is no reason why we in India can't offer these services to every remote human being. I'm working on autism, for example. Autism sexual disorder, frightening work. You worry about this called the Silicon Valley syndrome, right? Young people get it more often than anybody else. And you know, there is some research going on there. Much of it is, you know, kind of half-baked understanding. But there is certainly research going on. What do I do about it as an intervention? A lot can be done. At three months of age, you can start children showing signs of neurodevelopment disorders. You wait until they are 10, you can still do something. But at the age of three months, I was in a panel discussion once with a mother. She was saying that she did not listen to her family members. She recognized, thanks to support that she had, that her three-month-old was showing neurodevelopment disorder. Was diagnosed at the age of three as a, you know, autism spectrum disorder. But she started acting at the age of three months. Today, he's a civil engineer. If you didn't know he was autistic, you couldn't tell. Because the brain recovered rapidly. Now, what if we can offer this service to a remote corner of the country through these community health areas. Because the techniques are not that complex. Thank you very much for bringing up that question. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Moore, thank you from here. So that we can get. Now I request our director, Mr. Sotam Sarkar, to offer Dr. Moore a memento as a token of our appreciation of your generosity and for having accepted our invitation <laughs> at one go. Outside, that is non IMCians, ask us what is so different about I am Calcutta. And many of us tell them that it's because the I am Calcutta family is very close to the grassroots. It is this unique characteristic that we see in our alumni, our students, staff, faculty, and indeed, this is something that recently remained talk of the town and the institute in terms of healthcare management in the country, especially because of COVID-19. Mr. Moore, you brought this value of responsiveness of the health outcomes so subtly. 
from the notion of us as custodians of our health to the values of health service and proper incentives. How vividly you showed us that as managers, we need to go beyond plain replication of products when we talk about healthcare. Thank you for saying it through the examples that you have experienced, say in Rwanda, Peru, have learned from Israel, talked about UK, and your very interesting observation of the government's desire to stay in the health business, which is possibly not going to stay, not going to change very soon. It really shows how one needs to trust the stakeholders rather than micromanaging. In fact, you brought in such self-effacing qualities while referring to co-creating solutions just now when you talked about the community healthcare system in Alaska. When you see it, we still have a lot to learn from others. Your examples of the number of C-section in Kerala or increase in resources in Bihar or the possibility of working with pharmacies, all these will help us in reflecting how we manage healthcare. On behalf of Orijit Mukherjee's family, I am Calcutta community with our students, staff, some of our alumni who are here today, and our faculty who got a glimpse of the future of healthcare in your talk. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, students, for the questions that you asked. I'm sure there are many more. Thanks, Hida and Vaiba, for the wonderful anchoring. And maybe we will now see more projects related to healthcare in the remaining terms of the academic year. Thank you so much.